Welcome to EdTech Examined, a series about educational technology and what you need to know. I'm Eric Christensen. And I'm Chris Hans. This is episode one, published July 7th, 2020. So welcome to episode one of EdTech Examined. I am Eric Christensen. And I'm Chris Hans. How are you doing today, Chris? I'm doing pretty good. How about yourself? Pretty good. We're recording our first episode of EdTech Examined. So I thought we would start off today's podcast uh, just telling listeners why we're doing this, what we plan to cover in this podcast, what they can expect when we're going to publish a, a few things like that. And then we can we can get into the, the nitty gritty details of education technology. Yeah, sounds good. So first off, we're doing this for the first time. We're both educators. I think it's important perhaps maybe to introduce ourselves. So before we get into the details of this, so Chris, do you want to take us uh, on a brief bio of your background and experience and, and kind of uh, anything that you, you want to talk about with regards to ed tech or what, what you're interested in? Yeah, for sure. So. Um... I mean, my career path hasn't been conventional by any means. Uh, I was I did my first startup in '99, tech startup during the boom bust cycle. Uh, I've been a a banker I, in personal banking, and then I went into um, working in not for profit. So I was actually at the Art Gallery of Calgary, where I was director of business and operations, which is now Contemporary Calgary. Uh, did my MBA during that time, and then I went back to banking, thinking business banking would be different than personal, but it wasn't. And at that point, I quit and um, uh, started uh, doing consulting. And during that time, back in the day, you were not allowed to go and actually work for a bank and uh, do something else on the side. So I, I started it up uh, uh, before going into the bank and then I had to kind of put it on hold and then went back into it and then started teaching in 2005. And that was uh, after I departed from uh, CIBC. So I've been teaching uh, since 2005 at the Bissett School of Business. Um, and uh, I, I used to teach entrepreneurship, which was a mandatory course for every student at the um, college at that time uh, in the applied degree program. After this semester, I'm um, over 75 courses that I've taught, um, of which about a third, even actually more than a third, have been through online delivery. So, um, you know, in terms of those courses as well, it's uh, it's quite the the variety. I mean, maybe you can just uh, we'll have some information up on the website if you want to go and look into it. I don't like talking too much about myself, but. In any event, uh, I thought, especially given the fact that we went to uh, online delivery after the COVID-19 pandemic, we thought that this was an important thing to go and do uh, to share some of the technological tools that can actually assist and make the experience a lot better. So that's a little bit about myself uh, from an education standpoint. And uh, right now, um, I, uh, I also co-founded a interdisciplinary c consultancy um, it's called market grade and so uh, we are sort of short pitch is if uh, you want to take a product to market we basically make it market ready hence the name market grade um, but we have uh, architect on our team we do branding communications all forms of design from graphic web industrial design right down to strategy and execution so that's uh, that's my actual day job my background is like chris's a little bit interdisciplinary in a more steady kind of position now but it's been a winding road i originally studied international relations at the university of british columbia's okanagan campus so political science history that's always been and, and continues to be a lifelong interest i am a librarian by trade so i did my master of library and information studies at the university of alberta i finished that in I, 2014 doesn't seem like that long ago but it was and i've done a couple of different things since then i started uh, working at the uva's faculty of education actually i worked in the education technology department i've always loved working with tech long time computer enthusiast programming web development uh, video games user interfaces all of that stuff so working in ed tech was really interesting because it was the first time that i 
took those tech skills and then I put them into an education environment. Now librarians are in higher education are educators, so that set me up well. And I am now an academic librarian in Calgary, Alberta. So that's kind of my background. I continue to blog. I have things we can talk about later uh, about tech and all that stuff. It's interesting for this podcast. I, I agree with you, Chris. I mean, it was it's a timely thing to do because of the the pandemic and everything that's happening. I think we we met over Twitter. I tweeted, "Who wants to collaborate on a on a podcast?" And I think you actually suggested EdTech. So we we've actually haven't met face to face, or if we have, we don't remember. So we've been. This is a literally a born digital product, uh, born distance, so to speak. So that's interesting. I would. I think we should probably get into some of the details. So the, the structure of this podcast will be loose, but we have a few sections laid out uh, that we'll probably return to. I think the first thing we should start with is some uh, listener questions. Now, this is the first episode, so we don't exactly have a, a huge social media following at this point. We hope to take um, social media questions, particularly from Twitter or otherwise, by email. Time being, we're going to discuss a question that's come up a number of times that I've heard from faculty colleagues at the university that I work at. And I think that's it's it's an important thing when we're talking about education technology, because as you said, Chris, we are in a period where we have to teach online with as a less than ideal preparation, perhaps is the best way to say it. So the question is, how do I improve the audio quality when recording uh, videos for online learning? So there's there's a couple of things that I if you, that I'd like to just point out, little things that Chris and I have learned that I've learned over the years that that really make a big difference. So for this podcast, of course, we're using some more professional equipment, so we don't expect people who work in education, especially if they've never done online teaching or record lectures or sound bites and things to know this. But there's a couple of things that you can do when you do online teaching. The first is that, you know, you want to make sure that any recording you do is in a relatively quiet room. I've seen pictures of people who are hiding under a blanket. I don't know if that's totally necessary, but at least have the door closed. Uh, a smaller room is better than a larger one to reduce echo and things like this. You know, Chris and I have pretty limited echo here. Another tip is to speak evenly and clearly, but one that people often overlook is the mouse that they're using. Uh, this is particularly problematic if you use a laptop and you're used to the built-in clicker. Uh, I can always tell when someone has recorded something on a laptop because the speakers actually pick up not only the keyboard but the physical clicks of the trackpad. So I, I always suggest to people that a little bit of a click in the background is fine, but tr if you're using a laptop and you're using the laptop screen and everything, try to use an external mouse. Anything that can reduce that click sound. On my Mac here, when we're podcasting, I have a, a trackpad on the Mac that I'm using with my left hand and I'm not clicking in it. I'm just, I'm doing the tap on the trackpad. Uh, there's many clickless, if, if that's a word, I'm going to coin it, uh, clickless mice that you can get where they where the buttons actually make no sound and they're totally silent. So little things like that can go a long way to improving the recording quality. Chris, did you have any uh, just experience? Because you have such so much experience from teaching online courses that you'd want to add in terms of you know quality for microphone. It could, I guess it could be synchronous or asynchronous. It doesn't have to necessarily be a recorded video. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think one other thing that we found, uh, especially preparing for this podcast, is your mic should be uh, kind of like the rule of thumb is just to take your thumb and your pinky and extend it out and it should be a, about that distance from the, the actual mic. Um, and I mean, obviously, we're using actual, you know, decent mic, uh, mics, but um, you could even use your actual microphone that you have, might have for your phone, right? So... I think the uh, you brought up a good point in terms of the actual uh, devices and the clicking. I mean, another thing that I usually do if I am presenting something, let's say, off of uh, PowerPoint slides is just using the keyboard itself and just using the keys to advance the slides. Um, I've used a clicker before as well, just a you know a remote clicker. So, but I, even with that one, it, you should probably get the ones that are clickless. If, <laughs> again, if there is like a term of click list but um, yeah, and then uh, 
I think, you know, you talked about uh, the uh, smaller room, uh, obviously any kind of distractions or noise. Uh, some people even, uh, they have this, uh, they suggest having a pop filter to go and uh, limit just the popping sound. And I don't know, Eric wants to get one just to make us look a little bit more legit. So maybe we'll get one. But right now we're not using pop filters. And I'm sure the, the audio is sounding just fine. Yeah, we'll have to do a comparison, you know, when we're at episode 50 or 100 to see how we have advanced the technology that we're using. I, I really want one of those booms where I can bring the mic in from the sky. I, I want to look have the facade of being a professional podcaster, even if I'm a total amateur, you got to fake it till you make it. That's my, uh, that's, that's the, that's the key to ed tech. No, I'm just kidding. In some ways it's true though, because we're, we're learning how to podcast the irony. I mean, but we're employing what we know from online work, but it's, it's actually, there's quite a bit to know. I mean, I've been surprised because I've helped in the, in the past, I've helped instructors set up good Skype calls, you know, recording, but when you go to do it yourself and you're alone in a room and you have to do all the recording, it, there is a lot to it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Even another thing that we noticed is um, a lot of people were, uh, especially in the media, they were downplaying Zoom. And I think a lot of that has to do with just the co competitive nature of the tech industry right now with uh, Google and uh, Skype. Well, Microsoft owns Skype, but you know, they, didn't invest in a lot of the features. And so we're recording on Zoom. And, you know, at, at the end of the day, I, I think a lot of those uh, who talk about like sound quality and uh, sure, they say Skype is better, but I think a lot of it is just uh, kind of blown up a little bit by the media and you have to kind of take everything with a grain of salt. Absolutely. In this podcast, we hope to have at least one, I think probably discussion item. Uh, every every episode, we may uh, do some rebranding of these sections at some point. But I think the discussion item that Chris and I have talked about several times that have come up, that continues to come up now that many schools in the United States and Canada are going to be moving forward with online or alternative is the euphemism delivery. We've been talking a lot about synchronous versus asynchronous. So we, you know, Chris and I have had several conversations. I want to let Chris get started with this. What do you think about asynchronous versus synchronous? Is this a false dichotomy? Is there is there a better way that people should think about it? Well, and you know, it's it's interesting because some some of my colleagues don't even like the terms themselves, and they and then they get a little bit philosophical about it and, and just dissecting the terms. But I think uh, you know you have to keep in context too. That there's a big difference between what happened this uh, winter where we're doing this emergency remote teaching and actual online learning. So, you know, what we had to do, you know, if the, let's say if there was a natural disaster, in this case, there's a pandemic, that's one thing. And luckily, like for myself, I was actually very fortunate because the, it was just the tail end of my course. And so most of it was already kind of at, near the conclusion. So when we did this around sometime in March, but for a lot of people, I'm sure they kind of looked at this and they kind of just got pushed into it. And you have to also think about, like for myself, I decided several years ago that I think the future is online, uh, you know, with technology and just the reach. And so I actually had to take courses on both learning and teaching online, which now uh, I don't, you know, we haven't had that prep. People are, have just been pushed into it or forced into it out of necessity. And, you know, I think uh, kudos to everybody who was able to push through this and, you know, make the best of the situation. But now that we're heading into the fall and a lot of universities are going online, I think it's uh, important to realize that true online learning requires a lot of prep and it probably requires a lot more preparation than most would think. Um, and I, my fear is, and just uh, my observation and dealing with my colleagues or uh, attending meetings is everybody is going the synchronous route, which is basically a replication of what would work in the classroom online, which is probably not the best move. Usually, and again, I mean, there's, there's different modes that you can do in terms of synchronous versus asynchronous. And 
Um, typically, uh, when I've taught online, I do a bit of both, but most of it, when, in, when you can, you should try to make it asynchronous. And asynchronous means that uh, you should be able to do it at your own pace. The, you know, the students now they are actually are signing up for online. So uh, who knows what their work commitments or other extracurricular uh, commitments might be. So they will have like a week's worth of a module and they pick and choose when they can go and complete it. And so, and then there's a, a lot of uh, tools that you can go and use, but uh, I typically will have some synchronous sessions, but those synchronous sessions aren't lectures. And so, and again, you have to look at it, even when I'm teaching, I, I mean, I use a, a variety of different techniques from uh, doing flipped classrooms and having more active learning environments, but people's attention span there, it's getting less and less. So at most, I, I don't think I would lecture more than maybe 15, 20 minutes anyways, even if I was in the classroom. And uh, you know, from there, you should be t taking questions. So in the remote online space, I think it's very important to kind of think about that, uh, you know, these people um, in terms of the students, uh, is it really adding the most value? If you're going and doing a synchronous session and where I do find value for the students is where they have already prepped, they've gone through, maybe they're working on a assignment or a project, but then I'm answering questions during a, a synchronous session. And so now it's a little bit more preparation for the students. Everybody's coming in there. It's, uh, you know, they're getting value instead of, uh, if you really wanted to do a lecture, you could just record it and watch it at your own pace. And even for that, for the lecture side of things, they say that you should probably keep it a fairly short. Again, I think it's a people's attention span. What I've been told, I mean, I, even recently, even though I have been teaching online, uh, they say uh, the rule of thumb is about seven to 12 minutes. I, I thought that was a little bit long myself. I think, you know, people who are used to YouTube videos, uh, you're probably looking at like three or four minutes, but you would basically have these kind of little micro lectures. And you should also think about too, just because uh, everybody, again, they're thinking that they have to re uh, record themselves and have all this content of their own. There's plenty of content on the internet you could go and find whether it's a TED talk or uh, other videos that might be on YouTube. You can go and incorporate those as part of the learning as well. How's that for a start? That's a great, that's a great explanation. And I mean, you have all that experience as a, as a credit instructor, which I think is really, really valuable. It, it's a little bit different. My experience being a librarian. Uh, so for those who I've never worked with a librarian at their at their institution. I mean, we're we're doing this podcast mostly for folks in higher education, so university and college. But you know, librarians some of them teach credit. Uh, some of my colleagues teach credit occasionally, but typically my face to face instruction, I'm a, I'm a doing library sessions. So I'm doing essentially guest lectures in people's classes, which is interesting because for synchronous learning versus asynchronous. In, mon in many ways, I'd be curious to know if we could survey librarians versus, say, credit instructors who are used to teaching synchronous courses or, you know, face to face. I wonder if librarians are, are a little bit more used to this asynchronous aspect. This is something I've been thinking about because I've always kind of split the difference. I've done face to face library sessions, which are, you know, like a live guest lecture teaching research skills, particularly, you know, information literacy is what we focus on. But I also create tons of online resources that can be reused. So uh, library guides. So I'm used to creating these lecture capture or not lecture capture screencast videos, how to use database searching, how to use advanced tools um, and building things in a way that they can a be reused, but that students can go and rewatch and do on their own time. So when we had to shift to online only, I didn't try to recreate my class and do a library session in front of a camera. Part of the reason is, and this, this may differ depending on the discipline. So I, I realize we're kind of dancing around this question. And I think a lot of this depends on the area, but for what I teach, a lot of it's really nuts and bolts stuff. They're, they're, they're technical skills. And it takes a lot of practice. That's the benefit of having a face-to-face -face lecture because I can show something. Okay, everyone, 
try it. See if you can find research using the research question that I've helped you develop, and then they can run with it. That's hard to recreate without a lot of awkward silence and blank screens in an online environment. So typically what I've done is that I've created videos and resources. I've given those to students ahead of time. And like you, Chris, I've used that face-to-face -face synchronous time to hold question and answer and things like that. I've had this question asked of me before as well because of breakout rooms. And you and I were talking about that before we started recording. Breakout rooms are a great active learning exercise. Uh, and there's ways to do it in a digital environment. You could create five separate rooms digitally, like a video conference, have people join in, you know, assign them a room so they can talk about their work or, or collaborate in a, in a smaller group so they're not in front of the entire digital class online. And then you could, and the instructor can drop in to those, those rooms. That actually I've found worked pretty well, but I think what people underestimate is that that's a humongous amount of prep. It's not just counting people off and putting them in groups in a room. It's making sure that they have watched all the resources that you and I have created uh, a week or more ahead of time, a module, uh, making sure that they know what to expect when they come to class. This is what you're going to do. This is your room. So a lot of the things that we would explain in the first 10 minutes of a class have to be written out. It's almost like doing a transcript of instructions, so to speak. So they come with their user manual, so to speak. I don't know if you've felt like that, but I, I think that that's where people kind of underestimate. There's a lot of assumptions that we have that have to be so explicitly explained uh, in an online environment. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I think that's where the people, they're uh, kind of underestimating how much prep and that goes into the actual course design to do online delivery. And I, I think uh, easily it could probably take like six to nine months of prep. And, you know, again, now we have basically, if we're lucky, by the time this episode airs, it's going to be like two months of prep that you have. And in two months, I mean, it's still doable, but there's going to be summer kind of activities and there's only so much that you can do. I mean, I've actually been thinking about this uh, in terms of from uh, if I maybe I might even create like a little model for it. But I think there's a, a few ways that you can kind of look at it. And, uh, you know, there's the asynchronous versus synchronous. But then maybe from an internet bandwidth standpoint, there are some things that are going to be a little bit more intensive. And uh, so things like, for example, reading off of your learning management system. So, I mean, I, at Mount Royal, we use Blackboard. At uh, U of C, we use Desire to Learn. And I, I teach at both institutions. And, uh, you know, so putting up readings, HTML, announcements, emailing the students, having images, like that's relatively low bandwidth. That's more asynchronous, right? But you could also do on the asynchronous side of things, you could pre-record audio, you could pre-record video, you could have, uh, you know, these kind of sessions with video audio. Uh, but again, that from a bandwidth standpoint, now it's a lot more intensive, there's going to be more prep that's required for editing that video and um, audio, then you go to the synchronous side. And so, you know, you could have something, let's say if you do the low bandwidth again, it could be something like Google Docs or some type of document where you're collaborating on the fly, or maybe there's a group chat or some type of messaging. Uh, and then on the high bandwidth, it would be like video or audio conferencing. I mean, I've heard of some colleagues that they're actually mandating that students turn on their webcams. And I don't know if that's something that you can go and uh, mandate on, especially, uh, it's funny, uh, where right now I have a, a, a um, webcam that I ordered, and I ordered it like months ago, because once we went into this pandemic situation, they just ran out, right? they just were not available for sale. And so uh, I know of students right now, they just don't have a webcam. And it's not because that they can't even afford it, which is another issue in itself, uh, just from a you know, budgetary standpoint and whether students can actually go and afford it. You don't know what the person's personal life, uh, the situation, whether they want to be on camera. And so, again, I mean, these are considerations and I, I'm always of the opinion that you should look at it from an accessibility standpoint. I mean, I remember having, especially at Mount Royal, I mean, these students have never done online learning. And I remember the first session, they, the, some of the students asked me, do you want the webcam on or off? I told them it's up to them. 
And uh, again, uh, in some respects, I mean, some of the, uh, what they even say uh, in terms of best practices, audio can actually be better if everybody turns off their webcam, because again, it's that bandwidth issue, right? And, uh, and then there might even be situations where maybe the, you don't have access to bandwidth in terms of the internet usage and stuff. And so uh, I've heard of some students like they, their laptops broke down and then, you know, they're running off of the smartphones and I don't know how much work you can even do off of a smartphone. But again, these are all considerations that you should, you have to kind of think about which you wouldn't have to if they were in class. Yeah, exactly. And I think as you talk about the different options for synchronous, what do you do? What situation? It, it, it's a hard question to answer because it, Again, it's disciplinary specific, the kind of content you're teaching, bandwidth specific, but there's also um, a comfort level from the educator, I think. Uh, I had a question, I won't, I won't name the person's name, but recently about, well, where do I, if I do, if I do a recording of a video, because there's a couple of things I want to screencast or I want to talk about a topic because there's not an existing piece of content out there. I want to walk them through a concept. I've developed an infographic. Really, this is a really great instructor. So I imagine this video will be really good, even if it's just because of their, their uh, diction alone makes it inter interesting to listen to. But where do I put it? Because is this going to end up on CBC or, or, or the news because I, you know, I said the wrong thing. We're going to talk about some controversial subjects. That's kind of the nature of this course. I think that's another aspect that people have to think about. It can be done asynchronously with a few live touch bases or even no synchronous. So the more content that someone wants to put out there that could be downloaded or recaptured, uh, that's another thing I think that, that educators have to consider. Yeah, I mean, no, for maybe sure. Start, maybe starting with what you know, your favorite or your, with your top concepts that you want to outline and then leaving it at that and doing the rest uh, in a way that's a little bit more confidential is, is the way to go. And we, we have an article that we want to discuss later that talks about privacy, so I won't go too much into it. But I think there's a there's kind of a student characteristic, but also an educator characteristic that you have, we kind of have to keep in mind. Yeah, and I, I think it also, you know, you have to take into account your pedagogical approach as well, right? So, I mean, one of the things that I usually have with my courses is some sort of collaborative group project. Even for that, uh, I've used different tools to kind of put people into groups. At the end of the day, it really doesn't matter uh, because it, and in some ways, like it's funny in, in face to face classes, I'll usually let them select typically, unless I want to go and have a diverse kind of background or like kind of an interdisciplinary team. But it's a, in that uh, case, usually one of the reasons why I do that is because then they can't blame me. It's almost like you're going to, um, you know, let's say you go to the Mongolia grill. You can't go and blame the chef if you're the one who put all the ingredients together, right? And so it's that kind of uh, approach. But online, it's just a, a matter of um, necessity. So you can just randomly put people together. I usually wait like a week or two because of just the drop uh, ad date. And then you just put everybody into groups and uh, have certain measures in place. If you are going to go and do something collaborative, then you should have a team charter. There should be uh, certain... Um, you know, uh, check in points during along that path. And that's where, again, I think if you are going to do a synchronous session, like for example, I'm doing one tomorrow with one of my groups. And so they're doing a one on one session with me, we're going to go and answer any kind of questions and we're going to provide guidance direction so that they can make the most out of their group project. So that's again, you have to look at it from a context standpoint. And uh, I mean, this is a smaller class. Uh, imagine if you had, I don't know, 100, 300, 400 students, right? Like the, obviously, again, you have to kind of take it into context. Even in those kind of situations, I think you could do it. And hopefully you have some teaching assistant and support. But uh, I think, you know, technology has made it possible to do things that wouldn't otherwise be deemed, um, uh, you know, possible. And I, I think you should really, uh, in terms of the instructors and professors out there, they should... Uh, rethink like those underappreciated workhorses of uh, the discussion boards, um, you know, just readings, videos, uh, where you can just have links to like a TED talk or a YouTube. 
again, you don't have to go and create the content. The the content that's there's already tons of content out there. I think the biggest problem, I mean, especially you, Eric, you can probably attest to this. I think our biggest problem is that we have like an information overload. And especially when it comes from a research standpoint, there's too much information out there and finding the right information to actually go and, um, you know, do your paper or an essay or, uh, you know, research project. I think that's where it really becomes a, an issue. But again, I, I think don't underestimate those parts. Um, I don't think you, everybody needs to go and record everything. In fact, actually, for uh, one of my courses that I've been teaching for years online, I've even offered to record myself, this is given that I've taught it so many times. And uh, uh, what you have seen, they actually said one of the best practices is not to have the video. And again, it's more so because uh, uh, how many people want to go and watch a lengthy video? If you are going to have videos, I mean, a lot in that course we've used, uh, we've selected videos from just off of um, YouTube or TED Talks. And again, it's just to go and reemphasize the content. And you also, I guess you also have to think about like everybody learns in a different way. So some people want to go and have something visual. Some are okay with audio. And the nice thing is these days you can even take that text that might be uh, in terms of a reading and have your smartphone or your computer read it out to you and make it almost like a podcast. Yeah, the dictation features that we have for our tools are amazing. And I have even 10 years ago or more when I was in my undergrad, we're using that because I, I had, you know, so many things to read that I had to have it read to me. Before we go on to news, because we have a couple of news items to talk about today, I have, I want to touch on something that you said about uh, attention span and when we think about recording and technology, because the advent of podcasts and things like that and audiobooks is really quite astounding if you think about it. I mean, it's kind of Gutenberg-esque in terms of the, sp of the spoken word, and I'm not the first person to say that. There's, there's several academics who have pointed that out, so I'm not, I'm not taking credit for it. And so someone asked me, they said, well, why is it that lectures or videos should remain so short or we have try to keep them th those snippets so short when people will go and listen to an hour or two hour podcast? And I think that I think you hit it by saying, well, sometimes rather than record myself, I'll include a TED talk or a podcast or, a, you know, an interview. And that conversational context, that kind of spoken word is something that I think is engaging. People love narratives and stories and kind of that back and forth, but a lecture doesn't translate as well in at least its original form, not chopped up uh, from the class where you can have questions interjected and that there's a conversational physical presence aspect to that kind of teaching that is very difficult to duplicate identically, like you said, in a, in a synchronous online environment. And I suspect that's probably the case. The attention span, we do have the attention span for an, for a narrative and conversation and, and kind of that back and forth, but not for the lecture. <laughs> I think that's maybe where the cutoff is. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, it's funny, especially like a lot of the courses that I've taught have been in the evening. And when you're doing an evening course, it's almost like you have to be a little bit part time uh, kind of entertainer as well, because uh, you have to, again, think about the, the student and what they've been through. I mean, I usually put in a full work day before going in uh, to go and teach. Imagine for the student, uh, it's the same kind of situation. And so if now all of a sudden, if you're going to go and talk for an hour, which it's probably not recommended, but uh, again, I, it's not you got to go and make the most out of that class time and uh, sort of my approach is always to go and have them read beforehand and then we work on activities but that's my kind of technique but uh, again everybody's going to have their own teaching style and uh, you have to kind of look at how is the technology going to go and support you in your pedagogical approach again so we have a, a, a section i'm hoping that for these episodes that we'll be able to cover a couple of news stories uh, thankfully that the news cycle, unlike the tech industry, education news cycle stays relevant a little bit longer, which is good for us because we can get a chance to kind of digest it. So some of the stories we're talking about, uh, you know, came out a little while ago, but I think um, I think it's interesting to touch on. I'm, I, I'd suggest that we start with this first one from the New York Times. So there was an interesting story that came out titled What We're Learning About Online Learning, which is, it is a great title. It's exactly what they talk about. And the article focuses mostly on K-12 in the United States. 
uh, because I think that's where the larger challenges are probably over higher education in terms of access to equipment. So I won't I won't dwell on that. I think we've covered actually most of what we could talk about uh, in this article just from our discussion item. You know, physical presence matters. They they discuss some of the research around the need for facilitation and prep and stuff like that. So I think we've covered this, but there's one aspect that came out of this article that I that that I think we should at least draw people's attention to, which it is a story from an instructor in a in a school who recorded all these videos for students and the technical glitches and then ended up re re-recording some of this stuff uh, because a student wasn't able to access and things like that. So I, it's interesting to me that the instructor or the educator works as kind of like an IT consultant in this regard. You have to deal with these day-to-day -day things um, that perhaps we wouldn't think of, that would, you know, our university IT department would handle had the student, you know, encountered an issue uh, in a regular class or something like that. Yeah, no, for sure. And it's funny you even mentioned that, like think about it, even in the classroom. So, you know, the business communications course that I teach, we usually at the end, their final uh, deliverable is a presentation. And I'll tell you every time, so it, normally I want to go and recreate like what an actual boardroom environment would be. So I usually book one of the, the boardrooms, so either the, the Basit um, boardroom or the Sinclair one. And every time I go in there, always run into technical glitches. Then, you know, I only have the actual team show up for their presentation. They only present to me. I'm acting as a representative of the company that they chose for their group project. But, you know, it's, it's funny because uh, when we're going from team to team, if one person just screws up the, the computer, every time I think in the now the four plus years that I've been teaching that course, we always end up going longer than what I've scheduled. And it's just because of technical glitches. And so now imagine those technical glitches being remote. And so, again, you got to go and think about whether you want to go and, you know, uh, have these type of synchronous sessions. What's the value of it? Uh, put yourself in the shoes of the, the students and see, you know, is it actually going to be the best experience for them? And so in my case, uh, we decided and I, I mean, our course is actually coordinated. We did not have a presentation synchronously for their final project. And instead we adapted and we had them go and submit their PowerPoint presentations with what their actual script or some key messaging. And if they wanted to, they could go and record audio. But again, you know, imagine you have like five people that have to go and present and depending on their internet access and then something glitches out or what have you, you're gonna run into issues. And so, and I don't know if that's the, the most value in terms of the actual presentation. Uh, especially doing it remote, but I, I've heard of some of my colleagues, especially the ones that were teaching entrepreneurship, they even had pitch presentations on uh, by Zoom and they were judged and, and that kind of thing. And so, I mean, I guess it's possible, but how much value do you get out of it? I, I think somebody to go and actually write it out, it might actually be a better use of time and uh, at least you can go and see what their uh, thought process was. Absolutely, yeah. I just, it's fascinating, just the things that we, we didn't expect to encounter in online. And I think as you know, we do more episodes, you and I will have uh, more questions like this and more to report on. I, I think it's endless and I think it's fascinating. I think it's a great learning experience for everybody. I actually see it as a, as a positive. I learn, it's amazing. I've never learned so much in my life, it seems, with the situation. We have another news article that, I, that we found to discuss. This one's from a tech blog that I read fairly regularly. It's run by Vox Media. It's called The Verge. And the article is titled Exam Anxiety, How Remote Test Proctoring is Creeping Students Out. Remote test proctoring is a really interesting idea. And I've, I, I thought this was relevant because I think when we had this emergency pandemic, emergency online teaching, there's a shutdown that's one thing. But as we move forward, especially if people get used to teaching online, they want to take more of their courses online or do blended learning in the future, even when this is all over with, the idea of test taking and exams is, is, a, is a sticky point. You know, proctoring would be very much like a gymnasium. If you have your, your final exams in the gymnasium, uh, you know, there's people surveying 
walking around between the rows to make sure people aren't cheating. Remote proctoring is the same thing, uh, but done in a digital environment. And there's a few companies uh, that do this remote proctoring. So there's ProctorU, there's Examity, I believe that's how it's pronounced. And they basically hire people, strangers, to watch people while they take exams online. So there's like a camera, they're watching you. The article talks a little bit about some of the student experiences around privacy from these remote proctoring. So, uh, you know, you sign on to a system to take your exam. Someone says, hello, I'm John, I'm a stranger. I'm going to be watching you do this basically this whole time. Can you hold up your photo ID and all of this stuff to the camera so it can be recorded? Oh, and can you turn your webcam and show me the room that you're in to make sure that you don't have any open book materials and stuff like this? I found this to be fascinating. My personal view is that this is very invasive from a privacy perspective. But what do you think about this, Chris? Do you think this is something that's going to just be thrown out as soon as universities are confronted with the you know, the, the privacy complaints? Do you, do you think that we just have to rethink how we do exams and, and in an online environment and the, and the technology we use? What are, what are some of the solutions? Well, and you know, again, I think this is where uh, it's funny, right before uh, we actually had to go and move towards uh, online teaching uh, in the winter semester here, uh, I had some colleagues of mine say, hey, how are we going to do these tests? And they just kept focusing on the, the problem. And uh, I mean, I, I think this it comes down to an approach, right? And so, I mean, one of the concerns that uh, I remember, uh, and I, you know, it's somebody that I highly respect, but he's like, well, you know, how are we going to stop or prevent cheating? And really, at the end of the day, even in terms of that mindset, I don't think you can. And so now you have to adapt. You know, luckily for my any of the courses that I teach, I think there's only been one in the last uh, few years that I actually had like an exam. But uh, if I do do exams, I usually have them where it's more essay reflective. It'll be based on the learning. So everybody's going to have a different response. But for those ones, let's say if it was like an accounting or a finance well, yeah, I mean, it's it's going to be a lot different. And so chances are, but, you know, there's going to be people who are using their textbooks. And at the end of the day, I'll tell you, back in the day, I, I did a stats course for my undergrad. It was completely open book. Even uh, you may have heard of like in finance, they would usually give you like a, a two sided cheat sheet that usually people wrote like very tiny uh, kind of uh, print or whatever and with all your formulas. And Again, I, I don't know why what we kind of achieved by doing that uh, in terms of having just like these little cheat sheets or rec restricting and having students memorize because in the real world, not only will you have access to all the books, you're going to have access to the internet, you're going to have access to all this information. So what is the real value? The real value is applying that information. And, you know, don't get me wrong, like I think there is uh, something uh, of value in terms of memorizing some of these uh, equations so that you have it off the top of your head. But again, that's uh, if somebody's not a, an accounting or finance major, maybe it's not necessary for them because the information is there. I, I think people also, they need to start looking into what options and tools that they have in their learning management system. So, for example, again, I haven't done test uh, myself in my courses, but uh, over the last few months, I've actually been attending a lot of professional development um, sessions, and I was surprised to learn, like in uh, the um, uh, D2L at the UFC, and I'm sure this is probably of the, the same at, for Blackboard as well, there was actually the ability to go and create tests and randomize the questions, and so each student would get a different question. Uh, you know, you would upload all the bank of questions into your LMS. Again, you know, these are things that uh, during, and that's why I say that there's a difference between remote emergency learning where we had to do it. And now you have all this time to actually prep. And that's why it takes so long. If you actually had a test, you'd have to go and take your exam bank, upload it into the system, figure out how you're going to go and organize it. Uh, hopefully there will be support from, you know, teaching and learning departments uh, in your respective faculties. But, uh, you know, these are things that you 
are supposed to make things a lot easier for the actual delivery of the course. And uh, in some of those situations, like I'll tell you, um, I mean, again, there's certain things that they talk about, like in terms of uh, uh, universal uh, design of uh, education and, and that kind of thing. But uh, one of the th uh, terms, I, I didn't realize it was actually um, kind of, I, I mean, I used to do it anyways, but like I, I'm learning some of these new terminologies for um, teaching, but like, for example, scaffolding, where you basically have them break it out into different sections and have the students go and, you know, let's say it's a group project, you're going to work on one thing for a little bit. Um, giving them options. So, you know, in my case, like this semester, we experimented where we gave uh, for the first writing test, we actually gave the students a, a choice where they could either go and do the writing test or they could go and do an assignment. And at the end of the day, it, it doesn't matter because the, they have to, they're being assessed on the actual learning objectives. And so, but the students feel a lot better because they got to choose their own adventure. Right. And so and it's uh, it's interesting, even actually for the next thing uh, for the writing test. So typically in the, in the second one, we usually have two tests and usually I, I print off both. And then each um, uh, in the classroom setting, I'll basically go and have uh, one person writing a persuasive. The other one will do a bad news and vice versa, just to prevent cheating. So. In the online environment, what we did was we gave them both. And we purposely did that. We gave them both. Now you have to spend time reading both scenarios and coming up with your response. And I think for some students, I and I told them in advance that don't get bogged down reading both. And you know you should make a choice pretty quickly. Because if you just spent like 20 minutes now just figuring out the, you've lost uh, about 25% uh, of your time to actually write the test. So I think there are certain techniques like that. You're giving them more choice. You're, you know, there's things, again, you can't go and prevent them from not using the textbook. So now let them have access. Having more access to information doesn't actually help you. And especially when it's time restricted, it might actually be to their detriment so you know there's things that you can kind of do but i think especially on the multiple choice side of things use the the lms features that you have yeah absolutely and i i think there's like you said there's ways to rethink this in terms of choice i, I had a discussion with a colleague about um the idea of proctoring uh to prevent cheating and actually one of the one of the one of the things that they came to is that they they actually designed um, not an oral exam, but in kind of create an oral argument based on this reading. So it's a, it's like a philosophy class. This is someone uh, outside of Canada, and they were good. That the exam was is that they were originally is that they were going to give them counter philosophical arguments, and they would have to write a response of to which is right or are they both right. This is difficult to do in an online environment, especially with with time with timed things. Do you, do you have a time? In your learning management system and then people way overwrite they they you know they some people will send you 500 some people will send you 5,000 words that kind of a thing so they've actually gone to talking through the arguments and the problem orally and saying actually oral presentation and making an oral counter argument is actually a really good skill there's tons of writing in this course already so here's another another option so i think there's some interesting things that they can do and it's so easy to record this stuff and, and upload it as a student um, and keep it private i also wonder just the spirit of this article talks a little bit about privacy in general and i wonder what that's going to look like. And I'm sure we'll talk about this in, in further episodes. But right now we have a system where institutions pretty much sanction, they, they do a, a vetting of the tools that we use to make sure that they're private, that they're hosted in, you know, in our case, I'm sure that the tools we use probably have to be hosted in Canada if we're asking students to sign up and give some personal information. But I wonder how this is going to look in the future as instructors are looking for uh, more and more tools to develop virtual environments to either try to replicate the classroom or not. Are they going to ask students to sign up for things? Are we going? Are are we as educators going to have to sign up? Am I going to by the end of the year? Am I going to have like 500 accounts for tools that I didn't have in the past? I wonder if there's going to be an implication for that. Well, I mean, that's an interesting point. Uh, I mean, I'm a big privacy advocate, and I I think you are as well. 
And so again, that's where I don't see going and putting this independent tool on your uh, computer to go and, you know, uh, not only invade you from a video standpoint, but then also like the, there's keystroke logging and other things that you could be looking at. Um, it, it's just, uh, I think there's, it's an interesting time, especially even like from a workforce standpoint, right? Like right now, uh, there's people, there's employers that are going and looking at that and monitoring their computers. And this is why back in the day, if you remember, there used to be uh, where employers would actually provide you with the devices. So let's say your mobile phone or your computer. And part of it was because then it's the company's asset. And so then they can actually go and do whatever they want uh, with uh, their property. And then afterwards that we transition to this BYOD, which is bring your own device. And, uh, you know, these employers, they do, they figured out, okay, well, why should we be paying like $100 per cell phone plan? Students, or, I mean, um, not students, but uh, employees, they don't want to be carrying around two cell phones in the first place. I, I argue or not argue, but I always uh, joke with one of my clients. Uh, he always carries around two cell phones. And I'm like, you do realize only people who ha are uh, drug dealers have two cell phones, right? And he always chuckles and stuff. But uh, <laughs> at, at the end of the day, like how many people want to go and carry around two cell phones? And so that's where, uh, you know, the IT department, uh, eventually they kind of had to give in and open it up to Apple and uh, Android devices. Uh, but back in the day, it used to be BlackBerry was the most secure from a network standpoint. And here again, I think you're you're having this kind of same kind of situation where now, like how many tools, how many, you know, devices, what, what, what are we trying to accomplish, right? And so these are like more bigger questions to kind of think about. And hopefully, I mean, we'll return into the, the physical environment fairly soon, but uh, who knows? I mean, again, the only thing that we can be certain of that is the there is uncertainty. And so uh, and in those kind of uncertain times, you got to go and be able to adapt and change. And so uh, luckily, again, we have at our disposal a bunch of tools like I, I remember. I mean, actually, funny enough, like a little bit more of our little backstory of how we uh, connected. But uh, somebody who helped me a lot when I was going uh, to school and I actually I, I went to school at Mount Royal was Margie McMillan who was uh, the librarian at the time. And uh, she's a bit of a, I didn't realize that until I found uh, other librarians uh, say, oh, you know her? She's she's like a superstar and like the celebrity in the librarian space. And I, I didn't realize that she was. I mean, she was just so helpful to me as a student. And I attribute a lot of what I learned uh, in terms of research to her. And uh, back then what we used was Alta Vista. So, and I remember there was like web crawler and stuff, but like Alta Vista was my go-to tool that she gave me um, uh, instruction on how to go and search for terms. And, you know, I always tell students uh, back in the day, we had to go and into these terminals, then go and find the microfiche, load it up onto this machine. You would have to zoom in and out and then go and print whatever your research is. And then we'd have to go and manually cite it. And now like fast forward, that's like over 20 years ago, right? 25 years. Uh, but now, not only can you go and access these databases and get your research, it'll generate the actual citation for you. So I don't understand how students, and I don't think they realize themselves that they have that ability so that they don't screw up and lose marks on citations in the first place. And so, uh, you know, even with the student side of things, I think they need to start being aware of some of those tools. And for whatever reason, like one of the first things that they do from a research standpoint is they go and use Google. And I've even had, uh, especially when I'm teach, uh, teaching like first year undergrad courses, people citing Wikipedia, which is not a source because anybody can go and edit Wikipedia, right? And so again, it, when you have these universities paying subscriptions for all this uh, information, why wouldn't you use that at your disposal? And for that matter, I mean, even uh, in the courses that we go when we're deploying online, if they have access to the library databases, maybe you include some articles, some relevant, uh, you know, material from the, the databases that you have as readings. I mean, there's a, I'm trying to move as much as possible to open education resources. 
and you know cutting back on textbooks and uh, but i think for these test textbook uh, publishers now especially going to online they're probably developing all sorts of tools and resources for online deployment um, i actually sat in on a session the other day uh, and they were just highlighting all of these aspects and so it's, uh, it's again it's interesting times and we'll see what happens so many tools that people are unaware of i think we'll need a a huge increase in digital and privacy literacy as we move forward. Our goal is to bring a tip uh, every time we do a podcast. So, you know, a, a tip from Chris and I that we have felt is particularly helpful. So our discussions are mostly about technology. They're going to go in and out of pedagogy. But here we're going to talk about specific tech tools uh, that you can use to make your workflow a little bit easier either teaching online or teaching face-to-face -face or things like that. So Chris, did you want to uh, take a first crack at a tip? Yeah, so, uh, and for those of you who want to, that you can actually go and read uh, a detailed post that I made uh, back on May 22nd on our Medium account. So it's medium.com slash examined. But in any event, uh, I've been thinking about it for like several months and then one afternoon, uh, it was actually, I just wrote it that day, so it would have been the 22nd of May. Uh, I thought, you know, I've been getting these questions time and time again, and that day I basically said, enough is enough. I've already had two students ask me this, so I'm going to go and write a blog post about it. And especially, I, I mean, I don't know what their uh, devices that you're using, but if you go and look in the on uh, classroom environment, there's a high probability that many students are using Apple products. For whatever reason i think it becomes a more of a prestige factor um, but you look around everybody pretty much has like a macbook they'll have like iphones and ipads but in any event uh, people i was kind of it blew my mind that people don't realize even the the built-in software that's available on the mac ecosystem on their os and so one of which uh, so i usually have students having to go and do a contract and so i asked people to go and actually sign the contract and i'm not that concerned about the actual signature uh, per se but uh, every time every semester i always have students ask me how do i go and make uh, their own signature and especially if i was going to go and create like a pdf or what have you so in any event in um, on the os there's a tool on the mac os there's a tool called preview where you can open up any document and actually annotate and create a signature. And once you create that signature once, you can, it literally takes seconds to go and add that signature. You can resize it to fit whatever you need. Um, I didn't realize myself until I started writing this blog post, they've actually incorporated multiple ways of even going and recording that. Um, uh, signature in the first place and so uh, I what I did in my blog post was I actually uh, tried a few of the different mechanisms and in the past the way that I did it was using the trackpad on my MacBook Pro um, but I also found out that you can actually write a signature on a piece of paper and then take a picture of it and then it'll go and create a digital signature um, then I also used my iPhone 11 Pro and created a signature on there. And actually, I found out of the three, I found uh, doing it on my iPhone was the easiest. Um, and somehow, again, this is why I think people like the Apple ecosystem. So, uh, something that you do on your phone somehow just automatically shows up on your iPad. It shows up on your uh, computer, your MacBook. So uh, in any event, uh, it, it just worked and, you know, that's, uh, I just used like a document that I found for an application at UFC just to go on a show people. Um, I think I'm going to do a follow up one to this because uh, within the actual phone and I would suspect, um, so not only in the iPhone, but also in the iPad, you can actually go and take a PDF and edit and uh, annotate directly on there itself and so um, i'm going to probably do another one because for some people let's say they may not have a macbook or they might not have the computer and maybe they have the ipad or they might have an iphone um, you know again it gives you another option to go and use so anyways uh, something to kind of consider and even uh, for those of you who are 
um, teaching as well. Now you can go and use this feature to actually annotate and add notes, um, you know, make some edits if there's a certain feedback that you want to give. So that's, this is a, a good tool for yourselves. Although I, I know for myself, I, uh, I guess in the face-to-face -face classroom environment, I try to do as much stuff um, actually physically on paper as opposed to uh, uh, digitally. But, you know, that's just because I'm in front of a screen all the time. So, but now we have to go to the remote environment. So you might as well do what makes the most amount of sense. And uh, I think it might be a good idea to just go and use maybe your iPad, maybe you use the, the magic pencil and uh, it might be a just added kind of um, uh, t a nice touch that you can do. I've also actually heard of some people providing feedback using audio recording as well. Um, so, and again, that's a built-in feature to many of the LMSs that are there uh, in terms of the learning management systems, but uh, just, you know, while you're reading the paper, just record a thought and just upload it. And that's maybe a nice little segue for Eric's tip of the, the week or the month that we have. It's funny that you, that you wrote that blog post. I just want to touch a little bit on what you said about the signatures, because I actually have an iPad pro. So I, I, I've edited PDFs by using the Apple Pencil and actually writing out my signature every time, which is kind of a, you know, a 21st century, a fancy way of what we do on paper anyways. The idea that you can write your signature on a piece of paper, hold it up to the Mac webcam in preview, and it'll import the signature pretty well is, is amazing. Uh, just, just incredible. And I, in fact, I've used that signature based on what Chris has done many times now, uh, just because I don't even, I don't even want to take out the Apple pencil to sign it. I'd rather just do it that way. Cause it's, it's literally like a drag and drop. Uh, my tip this week is, is a simple one. Um, it's about screencasting and recording. I've had a number of, I get a lot of ed tech questions in general, but I've had a number of questions about what's the best way I can do a screen recording with what I already have. And Chris, you pointed this out. A lot of these tools, Windows included, there's a lot of default programs that people don't know about or they don't think about. In fact, it's, I think because we're so used to working in Chrome, people look for an extension before they look at the apps that are built into their computer. It's quite amazing. If you're using a Mac, uh, many educators do, it's, but don't worry, I have one for Windows as well. If you're using a Mac and you wanna do either uh, an audio recording a video recording of yourself, so with a webcam, or if you want to record your screen and do an annotation, the best way to do that is to open up QuickTime. Uh, when you first open up QuickTime on the Mac, you can go into File, New, and you can say Record New Audio Recording uh, Screen Capture Screen Recording, I think it's called, or Video from the Webcam. So I, this is like an all-in-one record yourself doing a lecture, though we've kind of advised against that. Um, record yourself doing a screen capture tool uh, or record audio. I, because I'm a librarian, this is really important to me because I'm often showing fourth year students about, you know, how do you use a, a subject thesaurus to get really good keyword terms to, you know, find out the language of the database so you can find the most relevant or articles, some very technical aspect. So I often screen record myself, not my face, but I have the, my screen walking through the process and I'm kind of doing a voiceover as I walk through it. Um, yeah, it's a fantastic tool. Now, if you're on Windows, the, from what I can tell, the best equivalent is a little bit, is a little bit uh, not obvious, is the, actual, the Xbox Game Bar. This is originally designed, I think, for probably game streaming. You know, I'm a gamer, but I've never been a streamer. For streaming and recording kind of what you're playing on screen so you can share it with friends and stuff. But this is actually a, a really good built-in tool. Many of the same features so you can screencast. I think it's primarily for recording the screen so you can do annotations over it. So Xbox Game Bar is a default Windows application, especially if you're using Windows 10. If you don't have it installed, you can download it I believe through the Microsoft or the Windows Store on the on Windows 10, uh, and it's really really helpful. So I think that about 
uh, wraps it up for this first episode of EdTech Examined. I think this is this has been fun. Uh, we will have more sections moving forward, uh, segments. Um, this is just our, our first take, so we're going to continue to flesh this out. So we want to thank you very much for listening to this episode. We really appreciate the support from educators, and, and I, I think Chris and I can both chime in on this, but we really are here to support educators, share everything as we're learning it about education technology. And so we, we wouldn't be able to do this without the support of our colleagues and, and educators out there. Chris, how can listeners get in touch with you? Okay, so contact information wise um, uh, for myself, Chris Hans, uh, my handle at, on Twitter is at K-R-I-S Hans, H-A-N-S. And my website is chrishans.ca. So it's Chris with a K. As for myself, I'm Eric Christensen. And you can contact me by going to ericchristensen.net. That's my primary website. I repost my blog posts there, things from EdTech Examined, news feeds, etc. I also blog about the mobile technology industry. And if you're interested in following that, you can go to techbytes.net. That's tech-bytes.net. And you can also find me on Twitter at E.G. Christensen. So that wraps it up for this episode. That's been fun. Thanks very much, Chris. No, thank you. You can listen to EdTech Examine and subscribe through our podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and Spotify. Or you can listen to us using your preferred podcasting app. You can also find our podcast episodes as well as blog posts and other information on the podcast website, which is edtechexamine.com. We post many of our blog posts to Medium, and you can find the EdTech Examined publication by going to medium.com slash edtechexamined. EdTech Examined is also on Twitter, and you can find us at the handle edtechexamined. 